All right, here we go. Today we have one of the great producers of our era with over 200 million records sold with artists like Tupac, Beyonce, Whitney Houston, Chris Brown, and countless others, as well as being formally married to Kim Kardashian and close friends with Southwest T of BMF. Damon Thomas, welcome to Vlad TV. How you doing, sir? Very well, very well. Longtime fan of what you've been doing. Um, congratulations on the massive, massive success that you've had over the years. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so first time here, I want to start in the very beginning. So you were born in Kansas City, Missouri? Yes. Okay. And what was Kansas City like at that point? As growing up? Yeah. Growing up in Kansas City, um, it was cool. I mean, like I, uh, my parents, I went to private school and um, I started playing piano at the age of five. And um, in Kansas City, there's not a whole lot to do. So, you know, I focused, I think starting to play at five, I started taking lessons at seven. Um, and um, I had a studio by the age of 12. You know, my mom, you know, started building that stuff. And by the four, I mean, the full studio by the age of 14, but I had my first, should I say, synthesizer by the age of 12. I had a baby grand piano at the age of seven, took lessons, all of that. And um, I uh, started writing songs at 13, 14 years old. So I was already focused in on doing that, kind of knew what I wanted to do. Um, and that, you know, I went to church, went to church a whole lot. So I played in church as well. Um, so I had classical training over here and I go to church and, you know, you learn that. That's a whole different, you know, I try to educate people on that church. And a lot of music, a lot of the music today, it kind of, a lot of the things come from that, come from, from us playing in church and, you know, commission, Clark sisters and et cetera, all that kind of stuff. Um, so growing up and listening to that and going to school, because I went to a predominantly white school, going to school, listening to Journey and, Kenny Loggins and stuff like that. You come home, you're listening to Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and stuff like that. Prince. I wasn't allowed to really listen to Prince, so we snuck and listened to Prince. That was like the the thing we weren't we weren't supposed to listen to, right? Growing up, but um, my mom kind of gave in by the age of thirteen. But we were trying to listen to it at ten. She was like, no, you know. But um, funny enough, I mean, Prince is a big inspiration on me. We bought the movie Purple Rain. We had a VHS player. And, and I, I probably watched that movie more than I watched any other movie in my life. And I think that that that, that had a lot to do with um, learning how to, it just taught me a lot of things watching that movie as a young person. Um, and then um, my senior year in high school, my mom moved to New York because she was a supervisor for General Motors. So she kind of ran the plant. They moved her because she was a black woman in that position. They moved her to Terrytown, New York. And... Um, there was a couple guys that worked on the line, meaning they built the cars. There was a guy named Reggie Johnson and Kurt Woolley. And they were the A&R people for Uptown, um, MCA Records. And um, my mom told them, they, they, she asked them, I guess they got into conversation. They said they were in the music business. She said, well, you know, my baby does music. I'm 17 at the time. And they were like, um, well, give us a cassette. So I sent them a demo of some songs that I had recorded in Kansas City because I had a whole studio. And um, Andre Harrell heard it and gave us a record deal. So when I graduated high school, I was on a plane, went to New York for three months. And then I lived in New York for three months. And um, Puffy was the intern at the time at Uptown, which is, you know, congratulations to Puff. He's the he's a legend, an icon right now. But it just shows you where it all comes from. And Mary J. Blige, I remember meeting her for the first time and playing for her in um, Harlem. We at a at a club, you know. I played Anita Baker for her, and she was eighteen. We're the same age, so she was eighteen at the time. I'm eighteen by the time I graduated, and um, and that was kind of the beginning of it all. So Kansas City, I just worked on music nonstop. I didn't get into any trouble. A student, just kind of did my thing. I knew where I knew the course I was on when I wanted to get out of Kansas City. And I went to New York for three months and then I went to California and we recorded the For Sure album. That was the first project that I worked on. Okay. So you come out to New York, age 18. Here you were, this church kid. Yeah, you church know, kid. With a, with a strict mother. Yes. Um, strict father but, and mother. <laughs> okay, mother and father. Father was right? about the grades. Mother was about get to get everything else done. 
there you go. Strict parents. You get to get to New York, and suddenly you're at Uptown Records. Yeah, Jodeci, at, Jodeci's popping at this point, right? Jodeci's popping, popping, popping at this point. Guy, so, no, so let's start with Guy. Whole... Guy's popping, popping. Jodeci's popping. Right. Now my memory's coming to me. And then there was a guy. There was an artist named Jeff Red, and I did a remix for Jeff Red, one of Jeff Red songs called "Love High." That was a big song. Mm-hmm. And and then I worked with Father MC. He was another popping artist that was on Uptown. And I remember right. meeting Teddy for the first time, and he was super calm. We're friends today. But Teddy was the, you know, Teddy's only a couple years older than me, but he started when he was 15. So at that point, Teddy was probably, when I'm 18, I think Teddy's maybe 21. So he was the biggest producer, one of the biggest producers on the planet at that point, you know, and he was super nice. And I remember meeting Guy for the first time and um, just being blown away by it all. Well, when you get to New York, and now you're not under your mother's supervision, well, your parents' supervision at this point, do you start to wild out? I mean, no, here you are, never, 18 never, years no, old. No, there was no wild out. We'll get to the wild out days. That wasn't wilding out. My parent, my mom was in New York. She was still there. Ah, so she's okay. still working for GM, remember? So she did that for a couple of years. So she ran this plant in Terrytown. We lived in Hastings on the Hudson. So they got her this nice, really nice condo that was on the Hudson River. And we just kind of stayed there, and I would go to the city. It took, like, probably... 45 minutes to get to the city. And it, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't see anything bad too much in New York. I went to go, we went to go pick up Mary one time and she lived in Yonkers. That was, that was different. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. That was like, you know, whoa, I ain't never seen this before, you know, cause we went to the projects and it was, we went, we went and did that. But, um, you know, other than that, New York was pretty, you know, it was still amazing. I, you know, you get to the other stuff when I, when I go to California. Okay, well, but 1994, you actually worked on Brandy's first album. Say again? Well, by 1994, yes. you worked on So 94, on that album was released. Album. So yeah. in 93, we did uh-huh. Brandy's okay. first album. We worked on it. Uh, so you want to talk about that? Well, yeah. I mean, well, one of the songs, uh, Love Is On My Side, Robin Thicke co-wrote it, and he was only yeah. 16 at the time. So let's, let's go to that. So Alan Thicke um actually hired me to work on some jingles with him for television stuff so i was working with alan thick and i went over his house one day and he asked me to meet his son and we sit at the piano and i played the piano and we wrote love is on my side he was 16 years old he so he was wow. so talented um i'm actually I, I believe that i'm robin thick's first placement so that's the first time he placed the song was on brandy's first album which i think sold five million albums to date or it's five or six whatever it's at i'm not sure um, right. Was that your first big hit, Brandy's yes, first album? Yes, absolutely. But it wasn't. So it was my first. It's my first platinum plaques and gold plaques and all of that. But as far as hit, I didn't have the singles on that album. I had an album cut. Um, and I and I'll give you this. I'll give you a little bit of the story. A guy named Keith Crouch, who I admire, still a good. He's my brother today. Keith Crouch came in at the end. We worked on that album for a year. Sylvia um, Roan had me and Daryl. Jo- no, not Daryl Jones. Daryl Williams, at the time, who was managing Keith Crouch. Keith wasn't even on the project at first. And um, Daryl, we worked on the album, and Daryl had Keith come in at the end, and he did I Want to Be Down, and then he did all the singles. He just And all the guys who worked on it, like Something for the People, my brother Sauce from Something for the People and Rashad, and um, we all worked on this project in, our, from, on a, in this apartment building right off of Lancashire Boulevard in Atsiko. I don't know if you know that street. And I lived yep. in Woodland Hills, but they lived in North Hollywood. So I would go to North Hollywood to go to their studio to work. I had a studio at my place, but we all kind of worked on the first Brandy record together. So we had to do demos first. So we did, and the, back then you just, you had to do a demo. And then you actually went into a big recording studio to record. It was different. Everything was on tape still in 93. There was no Pro Tools. So I did the demo of Love Is On My Side. And um, do you remember the Northridge Earthquake? Yeah. I'm working on Love Is On My Side and the Northridge Earthquake happened. That'll give you a real timeline of um, how this how this record was made. And I was at a I was at my buddy Dave Stewart's house in Woodland Hills, and I remember Randy Jackson from the Jacksons. He was um, 
he was there and I played them the record and he said, who's this? Because Robin was singing it at first. And Robin sounded like Brian McKnight then a little bit. So I remember Randy saying, he called him, you know, Brian McWhite. <laughs> you know, it was really funny because he was young and he was cool and he could really sing, you know. And um, then the earthquake happened. And, um, you know, that was crazy. That was uh, my first earthquake ever, you know. And the, I, the, the whole world was shaking. You know, I'm like... I think I'm 23 at that time, 23 years old. The whole world is shaking. And, um, you know, then we and then we went on to that record went on to be very successful. So um, and, and, and I'll get back to Keith Crouch when you ask about Babyface, because there's a whole story that lines up with that. Right. Because is it after that point that you meet Babyface? I do Death Row first. So imagine okay. being in California. Right. And, and, and you remember 92.3 to beat? And there was a there was a DJ named Theo and Suge yep. had Theo locked up. You didn't hear nothing on the radio but Death Row. You heard Snoop, Dre. You, that's all you heard. So I'm a church kid. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Right. So I finally broke down and uh, someone played Suge something of mine. And he went crazy. So I broke down and I did it because financially at that point I hadn't made it. You know, I'm still, you know, just trying to you know, figure it all out, even though Brandy was successful, you know, that wasn't, that's one thing, you know? And so I broke down and I did, I, I broke down and I ended up working with them on the, the only project that I was really due to do was the Tupac stuff. And we'll get to how I did the other stuff, you know? Um, but the Tupac, I, I worked with Tupac. It was the day before the Mike Tyson fight. They Shug asked me, he said, Hey, can you do? Um, so I did a song for the, gridlock soundtrack for Danny Boy. That's that was the opening of it. It's called I Can't Get Enough. It was the end title. I didn't even know what an end title for a movie was yet. You know, and later on I ended up doing all this movie stuff. But at that time, I didn't know how important it was to have an end title of the movie. That was the the, the song, the big song at the end of the movie. So I did that song and Shook was like, I want him to work with Tupac. So I ended up going in with Tupac and um we worked at a studio that ended up being the underdog studio, which is track record on um, Vine and Boulevard. That ended up being Harvey and I studio later. So imagine I'm in a studio that it's, I don't own it. I'm just in there working. Tupac comes in. I had the music. I worked all night on this music for the fight music. Um, and the song was called. Let's get it on. Let's get it on. Right. Hell for a hustler is another song. Okay. So we'll get to that too. So, um, Let's get it on was the title of that song. And um we uh he fin he wrote it on, on a notebook paper. He wrote it, wrote the lyrics, recorded it, and he said, You got another beat? I said, No. He said, Can you make one? So me, I'm fast. At that point, I'm making I could do 10 tracks a day easy. So I create another beat. And um I think that beat was smile for me. So we recorded that. And then we, he said, you got another one? I said, okay. And then I think we did Hell for a Hustler. And then in that barrage of songs, I remember at one point, five songs in, he started talking about Jay-Z and he's going to do this to Jay-Z and this person. And I'm like, oh, this man, is this is crazy. And then he talked about, you know, in one song, him dying. And, I'm, and, and you know, so it's all for me. I'm just recording. I didn't even realize some of the stuff that he was saying um, because it was happening so quickly. We worked from, um, I want to say, eight that evening until five in the morning, six in the morning, until it was time to go to Vegas, pretty much. So, go ahead. Well, okay, so well, let's talk about the song you just mentioned. It was called All Out. AKA, All Out, yes. Yeah, a.k.a. Uh, Die Slow. Yes. Right? And, and in that song, at the very end, when, when Pac is doing the outro, he disses Jay Z, Biggie, Puffy, and Mob Deep. Yes, and, and and I actually looked up the lyrics. It's like it's nuts. You know, Jay Jay Z, ha ha, boy, you at your funeral, punk motherfucker, big dick sucking lips. How you gonna be Hawaiian? So can I just say something before you even moms? go to one more lyric? I love Jay Z. He's the he's the goat. So I didn't know. You imagine you're right. 20, 25 years old. I didn't know about you know their beefs and all of that. I was simply in there making tracks and producing him. So it was you know. It was crazy when I, I I don't think I listened to the lyrics to um, what song would which what song was it? You have the list in front of you. Uh, all out, all out. I didn't listen to the lyrics probably until a year later because I was so devastated 
Cause I, he was so excited. We had so we had such a great time working, and he was like, "Man, when we get to Vegas, we're gonna go to the fight, and we're gonna do this." And and um, you know, I, I believe I'm first of all, I believe in God. You know that I said I'm a church kid. I believe God had His hands on me. My car, I had a Dodge Viper. They had just came out. I had a Dodge Viper at the time, and my car hydroplaned and flipped over. And I was in the caravan of 20 cars. We stopped in Barstow. I had never been to Barstow. I had never been to Carl's Jr. yet. So we went to Carl's Jr. in Barstow, Shug, Pac, and about 20 other people. It was Quincy Jones's daughter was in the car with Pac. Um, Shug's daughter was in the car with him. He was in that BMW that got, that got shot up at the fight. But we stopped and we ate and I was tired because I was, you know, when you're young, you're trying to be cool. So I'm driving my car. I had no sleep. I asked my buddy. I said, hey, man, because he had a friend come with me. I said, can you can you can you drive my car? So in Barstow, we stopped. He started driving my car and it started raining. It was 113 degrees outside and it started raining. So the streets just turned into oil slicks pretty much. So my car, these wide tires, it spun, it, it hydroplaned. He didn't know how to really drive it. So it spun around, hit a tree and flipped over like five times. The engine was on the other end of the freeway by the time the car accident was over. And um, the ambulance came, they had to get me out of the car. I had a, I, If I didn't have a seatbelt on, everybody wearing a seatbelt, I, would be, I, would, I wouldn't be here. But I also believe God had a bigger plan for me. He didn't want me to be at that fight. And um, he thought, you know, he. so I was in this accident, this terrible accident. And I was so excited to still get to the fight. Let me tell you about adrenaline. I didn't even realize I was, I was that hurt. Um, I was hurt. I went to the hospital. I broke a couple of fingers. They put me in a cast. Should have called me and I said, I'm, he called my phone and I said, I had an accident. They didn't see the accident because there were so many cars. And we stopped, we slowed, my, my guy actually slowed down to about 55 miles per hour. I remember it. And the car just lost control, right? Um, so the ambulance went to there. They sent a limo to come pick me up. Shug and Pac, they said, just get out here so you can, you can, you can um, go to the after party, right? So I'm on my way there. How far is Barstow from Vegas? Like two hours, maybe? Is it a two more hour drive? So from Barstow to Las Vegas is about two and a half hour drive. Okay, so I had that drive, right? So they, they um, I get to Vegas and the first person I see is Too Short. And I don't know Too Short. He, I just get out the limo and he figured I was somebody. And I, and I was like, hey man, have you seen Pac and Shug? He said, Pac got shot. And I was like, what? And I didn't believe it at first. And then I called Shug, and Shug told me to come to his house. So the car took me to his house. And you know, this all this all the conspiracies about, um, you know, Shug had him killed or whatever. I just don't believe that. I was there at the time, and Shug had his head was grazed from the actual shooting. I don't think you set somebody up and get yourself shot at the same time. That's just my belief. But hey, um, I don't think that, I think he loved, I think, I think from what I saw, he loved Tupac a lot. That was a big loss for him. He was devastated after that. So I don't believe he had anything to do with that. Right. And, you know, we've interviewed everyone from Keefe D who was yeah. in the car when it happened to Edie I mean, who was in the car behind Tupac when it happened to the first responder, to the investigator. Suge had nothing to do with this. It was clearly a retaliation for the beatdown that happened. Yeah, dude, that's, uh, that, that makes the most sense. Anderson. Yeah, you know the guy who he beat down was was a known shooter, possible killer, and you know they got in their car and they did what they did, and yeah, th that's the story. Um, you know, and I just want to you know just talk about All Out real quick. You know, he disses Jay Z, and then he said, you know, Mob Deep, little young ass juvenile delinquents, bang bang, you dead, Biggie, bang you dead, Puffy, bang you dead, and, and you knew some of these guys, like you knew Puffy. <laughs> I knew <laughs> you know, Puff, you but knew... I wasn't involved in any. That's not mine. That's not right. Mine. But yeah. but it's here's here's. He's on your track that you're producing, and he's basically yeah, I think threatening back then to kill. It was different. I didn't realize beef had just started then, right? Real beef. It's not like today where you know you're going to go where, where there's beefs and they know they're beefing. I had no idea that there was that was even taking place at that time. So, right, right, and you know, like you said, you produced Smile, which ended up getting redone uh, with Scarface. Yes, later on, yeah, ended up being a big hit. Uh, Hell for a Hustler. Uh, let's get it on. Well, help for the, so let's go to you know, the Helpful which Hustler, used, which features yeah. um, Jay Valentine. He's an artist that was on Jay Records. 
Yep. Who's, I know Jay Valentine. So Jay's my yep. guy, and I'll probably end up doing his podcast in a couple of weeks, the R&B podcast with Tank, because they're part of the underdogs, and we'll get into that. So okay. Dope. Jay wrote the first underdog song, so keep that in mind. So Jay, I got Jay a deal at Atlantic. At that point, oh, so that's what that was the next big deal. After that, I got Jay a deal at Atlantic, and then there was Babyface. So we can kind of okay. talk about it. Got it. And, and for let's get it on. You know, that was done for Mike Tyson to come out during the fight with yes. Bruce Seldon. And I remember when we interviewed Mike Tyson, he said to this day, he still feels guilty over Tupac dying because he pressured Pac to come down that he really wanted, you know, he wanted that song and he wanted Pac to come out, you know, in the ring with him and everything else like that. I feel a little guilty about him coming to the fight, me pressuring him for the day. Hey, you want to bring the tape? Don't forget the tape, you know? And I was going to go out with him that night. I promised to go to 662 with him that night. But I just had a little baby, and her mother was um, provoking me to stay home. So I stayed with the baby, and then someone called me that night and told me that happened. And I'm just, and um, this is just what we do. You know, I, I come to my senses, I come to the, my objectivity, and I, I know who I am, I know what my element's about. In my world, this is what happens in my world. This is just what happens in my world. That was part of my world. My world, this happens. Mm. But just because it was Tupac and I was attached to it, it was different. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was a big, they had a big, I don't know. I mean, that, that probably is Tupac may, may, have not, may have not gone to the fight, but they, I know Shook had a big party at his own club. Well, here you are in Vegas and this guy, who's very prolific, who you had just met and done all the studio magic with, yeah. suddenly gets shot by the time you arrive. And he's not dead yet, but he's in the hospital on life support. Yeah. And then a couple of days later, he passes. When you heard that news of him actually dying, what did you think? I was upset because I wasn't, I wasn't able to move. My body wasn't able to move the next day. I was in so much pain that I had to, you know, I had to go rest, you know, because I didn't realize that when you flip over in a car, you don't realize the what's going to happen to you the next day. The next day is the worst part. So I was really messed up. So I wasn't able to go to the hospital. I wasn't able to get out of bed. I had to stay in bed for a few days. It was, it was, um, it was really, it was horrific to me. You know, you know, you work with someone that amazing, like he's, um, and then I'm conflicted because Biggie was my favorite rapper, but I worked with Tupac. Isn't that crazy? Like I, I, I love Biggie. Just so you know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a dog in the fight with them. You know what I mean? And Diddy's a friend, and I didn't have a dog in the fight with them either. So you know, for me, it was about just making music. I love making music. It wasn't about that. I think now, it, it's a bit discouraging when I see the young rappers because I said to my daughter, who's 24, you know, a few years ago before extension and those they all all that stuff happened i said that doesn't look too good I've, I've seen that energy before and that doesn't turn out very well um so i wish that i, I wish that ultimately because you're asking me this question i wish ultimately that some of the jay-z's or diddy's would reach out to some of these younger hip-hop artists and kind of explain to them the danger in um you know all the beefs because the beef stuff is real it's not it's not a game anymore people are really dying behind it and i think everybody makes great music it doesn't have to go that far you know what i mean not i mean people want to fight i i say take the jake paul route get in the ring and box keep making records but the killing for me needs to stop you know ultimately yeah because a year later biggie gets killed yeah yeah and that messed me up i was i think that really shook me because you know i work with this one and this and i'm in it at this point and you know it, it wasn't just that you know, you have to have a conversation with the FBI. And I got to, you know, um, a good a good friend of mine who's like my cousin. He's my play cousin. He works with the LAPD. And, you know, we we be, I, we talked about all of this stuff. Like, it's, you know, over the years, all of it happening. And I had to be interviewed by people and all that. It was crazy, you know, just because I made records. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you're, the stuff that you did with Death Row, showed up on the Death Row Christmas album. Um, it showed up on the Gridlock soundtrack, like we talked about. And then later on, um, one of the songs that you did showed up on the Tupac and Outlaws, Still I Rise. Yeah. Uh, you know, then- like, Let's talk uh, about that for a minute. So, mm -hmm. this, now I meet Babyface. And let's go back to when I'm 18. 
my mom, when I was 17, my mom bought me the Tender Lover album. That's the Babyface album. And it had six ballads on the back. You know, there was the, the up-tempos and the mids, and then there were the ballads. And the ballads were the songs that I kind of studied. They're, 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 to me, they were the almanac to learn how to write song, melody, and lyrics. I think that he is one of the, the best songwriters of our time. I never knew I was going to meet him. And I remember being in my car at 18, going to school one day, and the After 7 song came on. Um, and Kevon Edmonds, who's like my big brother now, we're both, all of us are close, me, Kenny, and Kevon. But Kevon is like a big brother to me. And um, there's a song called The Heat of the Moment. And I remember hearing his, he's a high tenor, hearing this high tenor voice. And I was like, geez, this guy's dope. And this music is dope. And you knew, I knew it was connected to the Bobby Brown Don't Be Cruel album. I knew it was LA and Babyface. And then um, on to say, so Kansas City, let's go back a little bit. I went on to perform two occasions with one of my friends at my high school talent show, and we won. We blew the school away. I actually took a whole studio's worth of equipment up on stage and programmed it. I played the piano, and he sang, and we won that talent show. That's the kind of stuff I did in Kansas City. So going back to um, going back to um, never knowing I was going to end up meeting Babyface, when I did meet Babyface, Pete Farmer actually introduced me to Babyface. Um, and um, Kenny, Kenny, and at that point in time, here's a good lesson for all you songwriters and producers. I was offered because I had done Tupac and Brandy and I didn't have a publishing agreement. Big John had just got his job at EMI. Jody Gershon was the, he was his boss. And they offered me $350,000 for a publishing deal. And Kenny had done a, um, joint venture. So uh, later on, you'll hear about how the underdogs, we did a joint venture where we could sign writers, right? Well, Kenny, had, Kenny was babyface, so he did his with EMI. So when I met Kenny, he was like, I know you got this deal over here and they're offering you more money, but I'm going to, I believe that if you sign with me, I'm not going to give you as much money as EMI is offering you directly, but I, I'm going to offer you $75,000, but I'm going to teach you everything else I think you need to know to become who you need to become. And I made the choice to stay with Kenny and I took less money. What he didn't tell me is that he was going to pay me when I when we produced a song together, I would get paid as well. Like so whatever his fee was, he gave me a percentage of that. At the time, I think Kenny was getting $150,000 a track. So Sheesh. um I was getting 40 for the bigger for the A-list artists if I worked on a record. So it all panned out. I ended up making enough money anyway. But he didn't tell me that. I had to make the choice of accepting $75,000. And what I learned in that period of time working with Kenny was priceless. You can't, you can't give someone means of dollars to learn what he taught me. I was quiet. I paid attention. Um, and I think, so in that, when it, after the first year of us being together, Shook hears Damon's with Babyface. He's incarcerated at this time. Shook hears Damon's with ba Baby with Babyface. So he tells Babyface he had a publishing deal with me. I never, ever signed a publishing deal with, with Shook Knight. Ever. Wow. Ever. I signed the agreements when I did the records. Like there was a production agreement. And I signed that. But that's just standard. You do that anytime you place a song. That doesn't make me exclusive to them. I wasn't, I knew I didn't want to be exclusive to Death Row Records because Dre wasn't there. And I knew I just wanted to do the work, get paid, and keep it pushing. Right. So um, he went to, he sent someone up to the Edmonds building. And Tracy uh, Edmonds at the time, she uh, called Kenny and they were like, hey, you got to go. You got to go sort this stuff out with Sugar. We can't keep you in your deal. I had just done my deal, but we have to let you go. So I went up to, um, where's the prison, the federal prison that he was in? It was. Um, what year was this? I would say 96, 97. It was a five hour drive to go see him and Michelle A would be there. And, you know, and so that turned in, that's how you got me on the death row's greatest hits and doing that other stuff. Because I said, listen, I didn't sign no deal with you. Why are you, this is, this is a chance for me to have a real career and do something. Why would you interfere with that? He said, I'll tell you what, you know, I think he paid me like a hundred grand or something like that from prison, <laughs> you know what I mean? And said, can you please work on this? I just really want you to work on this Michelle A project. And I was like, okay, I'll do 10 songs for you. 10 things, I don't care what you want them for, but I'll do 10 songs for you. Um, and just, you know, um, I think we agreed 
to that and that he got my uh I think he got I think he ended up getting my I'm not really sure. I don't want to quote that. I want to quote that wrong. But anyway, I did these 10 songs, right? I did the 10 songs for him. So he released anything. You know, you have to sign a release saying, hey, I don't have anything to do with him. And we did that. And that was that. And I would go up. I had to go up there a few times to visit. He would have me come up to visit and just, list, you know, about get the songs together. I did that. And I was able to keep my relationship with Babyface. That was the most important thing to me. It wasn't about being punked by Suge, not afraid of Suge at all. I'm not afraid of anybody at this point. You know what I've been through. So for me, it was about keeping the peace and and and, and keeping the relationship with Kenny. Um, yeah, and uh, um, so L- I did that. L- Lompoc, uh, uh, Lompoc was a prison, I think. Yes, that's where I went. Yep. Um, okay. All right. So after going through that drama, you're working with Babyface again. And... Uh, were the first two kind of bigger songs, uh, Drew Hill, These Are The Times? These Are The Times, and Never Gonna Let You Go and, by uh, Faith, Faith Evans. Evans uh, Faith Evans, Never Gonna Let You Go. Yep. Right? So those songs, at okay. that point, um, that's 98, right? Yep. Yep. And then uh, that same year was the Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston song, When You Believe. Yes, I worked on that with Kenny as well. Okay. And I remember when I interviewed uh, Rodney Jerkins, who worked with Whitney as well, um, we were just talking about, you know, the greatest singers of all time. And Rodney, you know, who's worked with everyone, you know, who's sold hundreds of millions of records, you know, said flat out, Whitney Houston is the greatest female singer of all time. I mean, if you look at female vocalists in terms of just the greatest voices, the the greatest she's raw the, she's, voices. She's, she's the one. Number one? She's, in my opinion, number one. Number one. I think that's a very strong Hands argument. down. Who, let me put it like this. Who wants to sit next to her? Hands down. In her prime. Yeah. In hands her prime. down. What, what female wants to sit next to her and go toe to toe? I mean, maybe Mariah. She don't want that. <laughs> Mariah don't want Mariah, that smoke? Not back then. Not in her prime. Not, not, not like. Mariah was dope. Mariah is still dope. Mariah is one of the dopest ever. Right? Mm-hmm. But Whitney came from the church. So when you're talking about sitting down next to someone and just going line for line and you from the church, that's a different thing to be in. Because when you're in the church, when you're in the church, you got girls in the you got girls in the choir that, that can out sing you as a leader. Um, I, I believe that she's a great singer. I do. Um, and I also work with Whitney on Sparkle. So I was the last Harvey and I, the underdogs were the last producers to work with Whitney. So I saw it in the I saw it from the beginning, and I saw it in the end. And you know, it's you know, it's um, it was crazy to see you know in the end you know. But um, that was kind yeah, of because well, you were actually uh, weren't you actually working on her album, her last album that was supposed to be like her comeback album. We were working. No, we worked on the Sparkle soundtrack. Which okay, was, okay. So you didn't work with her later on. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we she was at our studio four days before she passed. So at the same studio Pac was at, nobody knows that. So take track record, underdogs ended up taking over track record, <laughs> and both of them were in the in the same room, you know. So yeah. Um, okay, and then in '99, that's when you and Harvey J. Mason Jr. formed the Underdogs. Yes. So okay. let's go back to Mariah Carey, though. I also wrote with her, and Kenny sent me to write with her. She's pretty. So I can't, you know, when you say the greatest of all time, it's kind of hard to say. You know, we've worked with so many. I don't know. I don't know Rodney's whole discography, but I know working with Mariah, working with a Whitney, or working with even a Jay Hud, who's a different kind of singer on Dream Girls. But for me, I would have to say Beyonce was the nicest artist I've ever worked with and probably the most talented one for me. That would be my favorite. Yeah, I feel you. Uh, okay, so so here you are. You've got all these production credits under your belt. Uh, you formed the Underdogs. Yeah. And then in 1999, was that when you met Kim Kardashian? 98. 98. Yeah, so when I wrote those okay. songs, those were around the same time that I met Kim. And how, and how I met Kim, let me give you that story. Kevon Edmonds. So I met Kim before then. I met Kim when I worked on 3T, but I didn't know who she was. She was just at the studio. That's Michael's nephews, and Terrell was my really good friend. And um, I met her then, and then I was at Neverland, and I saw her again at Michael's house. And um, 
So she remembered me from that. I was just with them. I was hanging, and she remembered me from that. She actually um, worked at a store called Body, and Kevon Edmonds, I would go to that store as well, but I didn't see her there. Kevon saw her there. She contacted him and said, hey, you." No, he asked, she asked him who he was working with, and he said me, and she said, well, can you put me in contact with him? And that's how that began. So it wasn't... Um, what people okay. may say or think it was her her doing okay so so you guys met and i guess she was 18 at the time when you guys first met yeah and then a year later you guys got married yes okay she was 19 at the time you were 29 at the time and you guys eloped in las vegas yeah okay why why elope as opposed to an actual Wedding. She wasn't talking to her parents at the time, you know, or her mom at the time, I think. Um, so, I mean, it was this young love, you know. I think I was 28. I wasn't 29. 28. Got it. Uh, okay. And, and one of the things that I want you to clear up, because on an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, she claimed that she was high on ecstasy when you guys got married. Yeah, I don't remember that at all. So I don't, that, that's her thing. That's, you know, they can say what, you know, I, I'll say this to all fairness. I'll say something about that episode. I think that's unfair to, um, at this point, first of all, let's talk about Kim. I'm proud of her. I'm proud of her family. I've seen Chris. I've seen Chris at Kenny's wedding. I've seen, you know, and, and, and we all speak and we're, I, when I saw Chris last, we were cool. I've seen her a couple of times. I think it's unfair to make those kind of blanket statements. Um, because we have kids, you know, you know, I have children. My kid goes to the same school her kid goes to. So imagine him when he has to deal with that at school. I think that she should be more responsible with those statements because there's a lot more to that subject and those things. And I could go into that and blow up the spot, but I wouldn't. And I've been very responsible in not talking about what that marriage was or what it meant to me. And, it meant, you know, I'm, you know, you can kind of kind of because it happened in the past you can try to sweep it under the rug but you don't stay married to somebody or be with somebody for four to five years and it's just based off of you getting high off of ecstasy you know what i mean that doesn't make any sense at all so right. i think that's a very irresponsible thing to say given our children go to the same school and things like that i agree uh, i completely agree um well so you guys are married and what's actually ironic and you and I talked about this in a, you know, when we first got on the phone, is that when I first moved to Calabasas, the house that I rented was actually my house, the old house that yeah. you, you and Kim lived in. Very nice house, by the way. Very yeah. dope house. I mean, yep. you know, we'll get, we'll get into that. We moved out of that house and moved into Hidden Hills um, mm -hmm. to help the family out at the time. And I won't get into details with that. But like I said, I've been, and this is to Chris and Kim, I've been really cool. So I think everybody should be cool. You know what I mean? I think that we went on family trips. We did things. So you can't just act like, you know, I think that it's, um, I think that I'm a big, I'm a, I'm a part of their journey. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's fair to say that I helped out. I did things and I don't have to claim to what those things were, but I've never, I don't come out and say anything. You know, I wish her the best. I wish her happiness more than anything. So I think that it's important that we all, you know, just stay responsible. I think it's unfortunate that blogs try to use her or if they try to find something on me, Kim Kardashian's husband. I think that's horrible for her. You know what I mean? I think it's horrible for me, which I'm the reason why I'm doing this interview is because you at some point you have to get in control of your narrative and do that. And it's going to cost me a lot of money because you and I talked about this this morning. When you Google me, you thought I was a football player. I wasn't. You thought you think I'm 52. You think that this kid is mine and it ain't. You know, I, I, I and, and these are things that I'll say to the whole world, Google is factual. So I have to actually probably spend a hundred grand to fix to so that I'm not just Kim Kardashian's ex-husband, but I'm the guy who's who won Grammys, um, Golden Globe nominated, you know, done things that made it to the Oscars even. So I think that it's important that, you know, you got to get in control, control of your narrative. And I really kind of listen to Kanye with that. You got to control your narrative, you know, and, and talk, and, and, you know, you got to kind of put out there what you want out there. So I'll be doing these interviews. Vlad is my first guy. People have not been able to talk to me. So I'm going to start talking and I'm not going to say anything bad. I don't have anything bad to say about anybody in the Kardashian family or anything like that. I think that they 
have a lot of success. And I love that. That's awesome. But I've also had success. And it's not all just wrapped around being married or being priorly being married to Kim Kardashian. I don't think any of your success came from being married to Kim Kardashian. I'm just saying, but that's when you Google me, you see that. You know, when you Google her, you don't. So I have to get in control of all of that. That's what we talked about this morning. Yeah. So that's kind of why I'm speaking. I'm not speaking to, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to hurt anybody ever. So. Well, uh, that same year you produced uh, Most Girls for Pink uh, on her debut album. Babyface co-produced that. And then um, you wrote uh, I Like Them Girls for Tyrese. Uh, Dave Valentine, a, yep. Yep, that was an underdog's production. Um, 2002, you worked on Justin Timberlake's Justified. Oh, let's let's, talk, about, let's talk about that. When we did I Like Them Girls, they Chloe and Kim used to call Jay Valentine, Jay Valentine 1999, because we did this stuff in like 99. That was kind of his nickname, you know. Um, and so this, this this whole relationship is way deeper than what everybody thinks. There's a lot of people on my side that are involved, and you and I will get into that later. You know what I mean? At, on, on a different interview. But I think, you know, I think it's, uh, like I said to you earlier, it's irresponsible to make a marriage that you married somebody, regardless if you elope with them or not, to, to make it around. I didn't know what ecstasy was. That's her. I don't know. You know, that's, she can claim all that. I'm not claiming that. So I think it's irresponsible for her to, kind of mention that in in a joking way because the media when you're one of the biggest stars in the world they pick that up and they attach that to the black man or the black man got her to do that i didn't know what that was that's a young white kid drug back in 99 black people didn't know what that was so let's be clear that ain't got nothing to do with me right and it's not like she was high on ecstasy for the three years you guys were married every day that's just ridiculous you'd be dead (laughs) if you actually try to do that no i didn't smoke weed i didn't drink or anything when i met when I met Kim. So that wasn't, and I still yeah. don't smoke weed. I still don't drink. So that, that's, that's unfortunate to just throw that out there. You know, everybody might do things that they may do. That's their business. I'm not going to throw out the things that I know that people may do or may not do, but to leave that kind of blanket statement, you know, I think is, I, I was, up, that, I think I was probably pretty upset when I saw that, but again, I'm still very happy for them. You know, I don't want to say anything hurtful about them. Well, in 2003, is that when you met uh, Southwest T, a BMF? I believe, 2003 or 2004. 2003, yeah, for sure. Okay, so how does this big, successful music producer suddenly become friends with one of the biggest drug dealers in the country? Well, I didn't know know that's what he did at first. So he was, we worked on a a project together um, with Tank. Um, So it was Sex, Love, and Pain album, which a lot of people will tell you is the, Almanac to R&B music in the 2000s. It was such a, yeah. a great album. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think I realized it when when I got paid for the album because I got paid in cash. I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, and I and I think and I'll say this on the record, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, you know, it was, you know, you, you, you live and you learn. But to this day, um, you know, he's out of prison and we're friends. And I was one of the first phone calls that he made. And he's doing good business. Now, everybody goes through things and everybody also has an opportunity to, to do something different. He's a great human being. He's one of my greatest friends. Regardless of what he did or what happened in that period of time, I never saw drugs with him. I never seen, I mean, he smoked weed, but I never seen drugs. So it wasn't like they was moving kilos and I saw while we were in the studio. I didn't see that. Okay. So was Southwest T involved in Tank's project? Yes, absolutely. So, so that was under, was he financing it or was it under his label? Hey, he or? paid for the album. That's what I know. But I know it was on black ground <laughs> yeah. still. And it was, hey, hey. <laughs> hey. hey. However it happened. However hey, it happened. I just got the money and it was, you know, that was that. Uh, okay. And uh, by that time was, well, number one, did you know Meech at all? No, never met uh, Meech. Okay. Did you know the Southwest T and Meech were kind of falling out? I did know that. that. If I got to know him, he talked to me. In the end, I knew everything. I knew what I was up against. And we all make grown decisions. I made a decision to be around him. He's a great, I mean, outside of that, he's a great person. You know, in this industry, you got to realize that whether it's an executive, you got people stabbing you in the back, you got people doing this. He was a person who uh, had my back. So that was a friend to me, regardless of what his other things that he did. But he also had other businesses, regular. It wasn't like they just, did that. They had businesses. He was a businessman. You know what I mean? And I think, go ahead. You look like you want to well, say something. Well, yeah, but I mean, yeah, he had he had car detail shops and so forth, but 99% of the money came from 
Look, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't. Activities. I wasn't. You know, let me ask you a question. You don't necessarily know that if a person's very. He wasn't like. It wasn't like Meech in Atlanta. That was in L.A. It was different. right, right, and that's that's what I was going to say as well because I think maybe a year after that, BMF blew, flew me out to Atlanta to just hang out with him. Just gave me some money. Just yeah, to hang it out wasn't with like him. that. I was a DJ, and and I saw the billboards and I saw like the two million dollars with the cars and they're giving crystal bottles to everyone and I'm just like, yo, this is insane. Like, you yo, know, it's never... obvious what's happening here. Like, clearly, no one's selling any records here. Blue Da Vinci is not a viable artist. Like, you know, what I mean, it's like. Again, 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 I, I didn't get to see all of that. Okay. You know? Yeah, because Southwest T was the low-key guy. Low and his main key. problem with Meech you know what low was key? that Meech was over the top. Yeah, they, and I think I think that, you know, they were different. And that's why it probably worked. They were, you know, hard. But if you go to even in the relationship with my partner, we were completely different from one another. You know what I mean? So those things kind of yeah. work in that way. But he was really low-key. You know, he had a, there was a lot of nice cars. And look, we went to dinner all the time. There was a lot of money spent at dinner. But... You know, you could you could own a car a car shop and afford to go to dinner. So, you know, he wasn't throwing around millions of dollars like that. Yeah. Yeah, whereas his brother was. Yeah, yeah. So And then that same year, that's when you and Kim started your divorce? We started the divorce before I met him, yeah. But around two thousand three. Yeah, somewhere in two thousand three at all. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then. And and ultimately, you know, the next year is when the divorce was finalized. And eventually the paperwork from the divorce came out. Uh, and there was, you know, a lot of accusations from both sides. There was abuse claims from her. There was claims from you and so forth. But from your point of view, now that years have passed and, you know, whatever bad feelings are gone, why do you think that you guys ultimately parted ways? Uh, that's a different interview. For Fair me. enough. That, that's, you're asking... You know, that's a, I don't want to go on to that, but I'll say this. I will say this. I think that I'll say this for the people, because you're talking about two things that are very important. A lot of people, and you know the truth on this, a lot of people, when the whole BMF thing shook out, they were like, is he a snitch or is he an informant or is he in that? I had nothing to do with any of that. You know the truth about that. And mm -hmm. and, and um, T will back that up and say, I never, you know, that's not something that I wasn't even supposed to be included in that. And I was included from a conversation, you know, that he had with the police, not me. So it was the opposite of that. So what I'm going to say to you is this. People can put, whether it's a lawsuit, and this is me educating the world. If someone files a lawsuit, they can say, you did. He ran up on me and did this. Because maybe they're trying to get, in, in the beginning of our divorce, for instance, there was a million dollar. What people don't know is they wanted a million dollars. Um, tax. Free. That's $2 million in LA. Right? So, mm -hmm. and that wasn't, I don't think that was a Kim one. So I'll say that, you know, but that's what was, so in, in that you have to make claims that he was this person because you're trying to get this money because there was no, there was no uh, other way for them to kind of get that money. Right? But Kim ultimately said, hey, I don't want that. I'll, she took 50 grand and that was the end. I filed for divorce. So she wasn't a bad person in that and neither was I. There were other people that were trying to get to money that I had. And, you know, I said to her, look, I helped you guys. So why should I, you know, I've helped the family. I've done things. Why should I be persecuted? So, it, but, but that doesn't mean they changed the court records. So people went and dug court records up. They're not telling you that part of it. They're just telling you the claims or this or that or the other. You could claim anything in a court document and it not be true. So right. that the media takes that and they build these stories and they build these stories. I've never heard Kim come out in an interview and say, Damon Thomas did anything. Right. So I thank her for that. And I'm not going to come out and say that she did anything other than we worked with fair to each other in the end. And that was the end of it. There you have it. There you have it. Okay. So then that next year, 2005, Southwest T is driving in a car. He gets pulled over. Yeah. Uh, the cop claims he smelled weed and so forth in the car. And I heard that probably wasn't true because, you know, T doesn't smoke weed while he's driving. Um, he's smarter than that. Right. But in the course of actually going through his car, they find like 20 cell phones, a bunch of different IDs, 
and four million dollars worth of jewelry. Well, I thought it was five million dollars worth of jewelry. Okay, five million dollars. I didn't know about the number. cell phones and I didn't know about the IDs, but I just know about the jewelry. Yeah. And in that claim, he said that some of that jewelry, or half of that jewelry, was mine, and half of it was Jacob's. None of it belonged to me. And he's my friend, and he's you know, we we we're cool. We're cool to this day. So I don't want to make him seem like a bad person. Shit happens. You know what I mean? And I wouldn't. At this point, I'll say this: I wouldn't change that experience for anything because I think it's gotten me ready for the new experience that I'm about to have and owning, own, having ownership in the label and being able to release my own artists and do that stuff. Kind of, if we speak about Kanye, he said, you know, I'll, we'll go, let's go T-Pain first. T-Pain said the labels made $17 billion last year and they only paid out to artists, meaning Adele and Drake and Nicki and all of them. Everybody only got 12% of that producers, writers, 12% of that, um, of that seventeen billion, so ownership is the is the is the is the game for me now. So I agree. all those experiences may seem like whatever, but when you go through that kind of stuff, it, it prepares you for the bigger experience and ownership and being able to handle those things and being able to handle uh, adversity and being able to go through that. I've worked so hard over the last four years to build this new label that's you know predominantly pop music. And I'll do urban music and R&B music, but I wanted to do something. We owned R&B in the 2000s, so I wanted to do something different. And I'm very happy with Thomas Crown and what we're doing with that. So going through that, I don't have, uh, I can call T for some advice. You don't think he knows about business? It's good to have those relationships still. So, um, you know, I don't want to make it seem like he did something bad to me. It was my journey. That's the path God wanted me on. So I had to go through those things to become the record label owner. Like, you know, my ex-partner is the chairman of the Grammy board, and I'm proud of him. He earned that at the end of the day. And, um, you know, if he's successful and I'm successful, it helps us both. It helps our legacy, you know. So, go. Well, you know, T gets pulled over. They find the $5 million in jewelry. And he could have just let that go. But he tried to get it back. Oh, and I didn't know. He that. claimed, yeah. I mean, he he claimed he claimed that half of it was yours, half but of I, it was But Jacob's. I'll say this to you: this is what I know. At the end of the day, and he knows mm-hmm. this, and I know this. Listen, when you're doing something at that level, and I think everybody's learned from it. He's learned from it. When you're doing something at that level, they know every move you're making. Not not that people can say this person snitched here. They know every phone call. They know everything. They have. They can pull it up. They can pull up all your stuff. So as you guys are hustling and doing stuff, just know that was 2005. This is 2022. If you don't right. think they know everything you're doing, they know everything you're doing. So there ain't no such when they call Takashi a snitch or this person a snitch that he don't have to snitch. They knew already. All they're doing yeah. is using him to confirm what they already know. So, you know, exactly. I, I believe that I believe that the I believe that. In our in the urban community, they're so about the street code. I don't people ain't honoring that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I never did anything to dishonor that. But people aren't honoring that. I've seen some of the closest people to him really, really go in and say the thing. So I think that at the end of the day, if people are gonna if people are gonna have a choice of of um saving themselves, they're gonna save themselves. But I don't think it matters. I don't think that you can look at a court document. And, 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 and call that a valid thing anymore because they're just court documents. I could go sue you tomorrow, Vlad, and say you ran into both of my cars outside of my studio and you weren't here. And then it'll show up on every blog in America and everybody believes that you did that. And I think that there should be there should be a way for for us as um, public figures to be protected from everybody just attacking us in that way, you know, and, you know. We get attacked. You know, if you're a public figure, you get attacked. I, mm-hmm. I only wanted to be a producer and a songwriter. I never thought of myself as a public figure like that, but I am. You know, that's what it is. It is what it is. It comes with it. That year, you're also having a lot of success. Uh, Omarion uh, did the O album uh, that you worked on. Marcus Houston had the Naked album that you worked on. Chris yeah. Brown's first album yeah. uh, comes out, and he's suddenly propelled to be a superstar. So let's talk about that for a second. Omarion... We worked on him um, with B2K for Chris Stokes, another good friend. And um, we worked on that project. And that's how we got Marcus Houston. They were all under the same umbrella. And um, we worked on those projects. And um, 
Amarion was the first project. So you are right in, in kind of pairing it together in a sense because Tank worked. That was the first Tank song that we worked on with Tank. The underdogs worked with Tank. That was the beginning of the Tank era. So if you go back to how you're going to act like that or Gots to Be, let's go Gots to Be first. That's the Steve Russell underdog era. And then you got How You Gonna Act Like That, which is the Eric Dawkins, my big brother for life. Love him to death to this day. He's my voice of reason to this day. But we that's our first song we ever did was How You Gonna Act Like That. And that whole entire um, album, pretty much, we did that album, The Underdogs. And that was the beginning of The Underdog era between Gots to Be and Tyrese's album. And then the success of that was during the divorce, right? The success, how you gonna act like that came out the same year as the divorce was happening. And Tyrese was my buddy. We were like brothers at the time. He um, tanking him said, I had this big house in, in, on, in cold, up cold water canyon. It overlooked the whole valley, Kim and I at that time. Um, well, um, they moved in the house with me because you go through a divorce, it's tough, you know? Um, we didn't have Instagram and all that stuff back then. It was just tough. So we had a great time. We they they made sure I got through that year. They were great friends. Um, we uh, and thus and those songs were created. So in those songs, um, in those songs, the song you're leaving out is a song by Mario called "How How Could You." And right. you got the do you have the lyrics to that song in front of you? If you go Let's to the course, Mario, of that, how could you? Yeah. Okay, hold on a second. Yep. Which part? That song was written by myself, and it was it was a you know three guys going through something. It was Dave Valentine, I believe, uh, and Eric Dawkins had broke up with his girl. I was going through a divorce, so when you hear the lyrics, you know uh, how could you let somebody lay where I lay? How could you you know this is all about that? This is the divorce song for real. How could you um, um, put me in the back and him in the front seat? How could you, how could you, how, all that, the Mario song. Okay, but w w what you're basically saying without getting into any specifics is that essentially this song, How Could You by Mario, is essentially about your marriage with Kim. Well, yeah, but it without, was about Eric's, being, it was about Eric's breakup. It was about, and Dave Valentine was my boy. He knew what I was going through, so he was able to word it the way I could tell them what I was going through. They they pinned it that way. And that that, that record kind of came out to be one of those big R&B staples. So then you go to O. O is the first Tank song. So now it's a different, now the, now the underdog sound is evolving because Tank can play. And I can play. We both are great musicians. So you got both me and Tank. I think I'm on the bridge of the song. He's on the beginning of the song playing. And, um, you know, Harvey's with these great drums and all the program and all the production is, of course, the underdogs, you know. And, um, you know, I'll say this, and we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about this more when I do the R&B podcast with Tank and Jay. The underdogs were um, formed by me and Harvey. We are the underdogs, right? Damon and Harvey. But the culture of the underdogs is a lot of different people. It's a lot of, it was, it was my ability to bring in a J and a tank and they're all the part of the underdogs, you know, because it's all their talent. And I'm going to talk about that more. And we're going to talk about, we'll do a whole underdog segment and we'll talk about the songs because it's really brilliant how these songs were put together. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that um, when we get to that. But, um, but that's kind of, you know, so, Oh, that's, that's, that's me and tank. And then, there's another song I'm trying. I think that was his second single off that album. That was me and Dave Valentine and, and Eric Dawkins again. And then there's um, Naked, which is Naked. Naked came, um, and that was the first break between the creatives because Eric and Harvey had a disagreement about a Marcus Houston song. So Eric and Tony are gone now. And Tony was also a part of Naked, I believe. But Eric and Tony... Or maybe, no, 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 that's not correct because Tony's on Naked. They're not gone. Tony's not gone yet. But I think Eric's gone. Eric missed Naked. And so it's Take Me, Harvey, and um, and, I, and that's sad for me because I'm the champion for the creatives. I wanted to keep it out of here. Harvey was, Harvey was a dog. It didn't, if you made him mad, that was it. So I was always the one trying to hold the 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 creative force together when it came to the songwriters and the creatives, you know, I love everybody I'm working with. Some people don't have to like people when they work with them. I think Harvey's a ladder and I'm the one who loves everybody when it came to that, but he was a great businessman. So that's why it worked. 
Yeah, and uh, shout out to Jay Valentine. I don't know if you ever uh, saw my interview with his father, Ron Newt. I know Ron Newt, but I didn't see the interview. You, you got to see. It's one of the greatest interviews of okay, all time. I'll check that out. In 2006, the Dreamgirls movie came out. So let's talk about that. That started in 2004. So mm. we started that movie. And I remember me and Harvey, we were talking about, we wanted to get into filming. People were asking us, because we were great producers, to get into it. And I said, we just got to choose a great movie. I don't want to do Friday. You know, you know, I don't want to do Soul Play, right? I need to do, I, if we do a movie, we got to, because at that point, we're hot, like we, we're not, also we're working on American Idol at that point. It's Clive Davis came to Harvey and I because we had a label deal with him. Um, so the underdogs had a label deal and we, but Clive really just wanted us to work on everything that he had coming out on, on, on J Records, which was great. And he had American Idol and he said, Hey guys, I got this show. It's going to be like the gong show, but there's going to be the music business. And then there's going to be American Idol. And I didn't get it at the time. Harvey didn't get it at all at the time. But once that shit blew up, it was, um, it was amazing, you know? Um, and we just followed his lead and we did Kelly Clarkson, I believe it's the first winner. Then we did Ruben Studdard. So now you're in 2004. We did a song called Sorry 2004, written by um, the underdogs. That's the Eric Dawkins era. That's uh, Little Ronnie, who I started. Little Ronnie is a huge producer now here in Atlanta, but that was his first big song. So the underdogs are responsible for making a lot of producers successful and wealthy. And we'll get into those different names. But um, so... Um, we did the American Idol stuff. So that's going on at the same time. So back to Dream Girls. We're doing American Idol and we're doing Dream Girls at the same time. And we're doing Chris Brown's first album. All this is going on at the same time. So um, in Dream Girls, we did 61 songs. It was only supposed to be 20 something to begin with. So when you think of the movie, everything musical thing that you hear in the movie, we did. It wasn't like we just did the song. Listen, everything you heard, we did it. We had, and it took 16 months. I remember when we started Dream Girls, Bill Condon, he was such a nice guy. You know, it was our first movie, and he was really patient. Because I thought to myself, we're going to do Dream Girls. This shit's from the 80s. It's old. We got to make it cool like Quincy Jones did The Wiz. You know, he made it cool sounding, right? I'm thinking, I'm a programmer. I got logic. I'm a program. I just started using logic at the time. I'm going to program this stuff and do all these cool things. He came in and with storyboards, bro. Like he brought these big storyboards into the studio and he lay, he was very quiet. He laid it out and we ended up doing everything live. There was no, there was a whole bunch. There was some sequencing. I did some pre-programming, but ultimately it was played live. And, and then let's go back to, let's go back to my deal with Babyface. I knew all the big musicians because I did all this live stuff with Babyface. And had I not gone through that experience, had I not made the choice to take 75000 instead of taking 350000 I wouldn't have known Greg Fillingaines. I wouldn't have known Nathan East. I wouldn't have known all the great musicians that we use. Michael Thompson, Tim Carmen. I wouldn't have known. I knew Tim, but I wouldn't have known all these great musicians that we used on Dream Girls. Greg, F Greg Fillingaines is pound for pound, one of the best piano players in the world. He was Michael's MD. He was Babyface's MD. I think he played for Babyface at one point, and then he played for, he now plays for John Mayer. So, you know, when you have that caliber of musicians and you're doing live production for a movie, it makes such a huge difference. So that 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 knowledge that I gained from Babyface taught both Har Harvey and I how to get through the movie stuff, I believe. And um, we were able to do it at a high level. So when when you talk about the movie stuff, it, it wasn't a collective of all the other writers. It was really Harvey and I that worked on that stuff. And they came in as musicians and helped out with backgrounds. But the bulk of the work of that, that was, we both had to, we both took that on. It was a different responsibility than making records. It's a different process than making records. So we took that on. And that was a, that's one thing that I can say we did is um, producers, whether it's Jimmy and Terry, LA and Babyface, Damon and Harvey, whatever. We took on, um, the movie business and we did a great job of it and our choices with movies were great. And again, when you, these are things that you did that, that these, this is a narrative that I want to put out about myself, you know, not just being a record producer, but being a movie producer movie, you know, we did all the music for that movie. It took 16 months. And I remember talking to um, Randy Spinlove, who's now, I think he's the head of Paramount. 
And I think he got that job after doing Dream Girls because he was the music supervisor. He would say to us, hey, 10 months in, I'd be like, Randy, you said this was going to take three months. We are 50 songs in. He'd be like, DT, uh, this ain't Soul Plane, though. This is going to be the biggest movie, you know, one of the biggest things. And it was the best choice for us. We were... Uh, we weren't paid a lot to do it, but we got money on the back end of it. So it was great. We ended up making up for that. But being able to go to, um, being able to be a part of something that won so many awards. We won a Critics' Choice Awards. It won Grammys, Oscars, all that stuff. Being a part of that, was it's a part of history. Um, so I think our second movie was, I want to know, Shrek the Third. And then we did Kung Fu Panda. Then we did... Um, Pitch Perfect later on. We'll, we'll get to that. So then there's Bobby. Bobby won a Grammy, which is one of ours, for um, Mary J. Blige and Aretha Franklin, the great Aretha Franklin. So when you say Whitney's the greatest singer, there again, it's like, how do you make that better? How do you make Whitney better <laughs> yeah. than Aretha Franklin? Or, you know, we work with we work with Elton John after Luther passed. We did that thing, and he's on a song. We did a duet with Luther and Elton John. So our, you know, when you started out this thing, I think you should do that again because you've mentioned... You went to the gangster stuff first. I'd rather you go with Elton John, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, Beyonce. Give me that list first, you know, if I got to pick. Chris Brown, you know. Right. And, you know, Dream Girls was, you know, nominated for a, a ton of Academy Awards. It actually won. Yeah, well, so those Jennifer songs. Jennifer Hudson won Best Supporting Actress, you know, which was a phenomenon considering that was her first acting role yeah, ever. Yeah, but three of the songs uh, we did were nominated at the same time. So that was the first year that... You know, any that like in the music categories, the three songs from one movie made it to the Academy Awards. That's a huge deal on your first movie. And, you know, for Harvey and I, that was that was big. You know, that's 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 a pretty big deal. So, um, you know, um, I'm proud of it. You know, I think for me, Harvey's still doing movies. He's done. He's gone on to do a bunch of other big stuff. I think that's what he kind of does now. Um when I make the, I'm making the choice to do the next movie, I'll do that after we release our first Thomas Crown artist, right? And we have some success. Then I'm going to make the choice to, I want to do what Kenny did. That's Babyface. I want to do what he did with Waiting to Excel. I want to write um, songs for, I want to write the songs for uh, a movie. Um, and I opposed to just doing a bunch of remake songs for a movie. I want to be the, the songwriter opposed to producing other songs or other people's songs in the movie and all of that. That's, I think that's my next journey in doing the movie stuff. So, um, okay. So dream girls goes bananas. Goes you bananas. Have this huge movie, uh, you know, under your belt. Then next year, 2007, you're still working with Chris Brown. You did take you down. Which ended up being a big, so song. let's go back to Chris Brown, the first album. So we do the first album and you know, Mark Pitts again, who's, super instrumental in our career, in the underdog's career. Mark Pitts comes to the studio, him and Tina Davis with this 14 or 15 year old kid. I can't remember the age at the time. He wasn't as tall as I'm 5'11". He wasn't even my height. And um, so we do the first album. We do some really cool songs on that album. We didn't have the singles on the first album. But by the time the second album came, we had Nowhere coming out with Jordan Sparks and Chris Brown. And we had Take You Down, they both went up the charts at the same time, which was pretty amazing. Um, one up the pop chops, part chops, one up the urban charts. And, you know, I believe that year uh, for Chris was going to be his biggest year, but then the whole thing happened with him and Rihanna. You know, it was, it was crazy for us because we were nominated. All his nominations were taken away, and we were, in, we were a big part of that album. I think we did probably 75% of Chris's second album, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and listen, from the very beginning, I always felt like Chris had the voice and the talent level to get to a Michael Jackson. No, he level. is this he's this generation's Michael Jackson. There's no question. I would tend to agree. I mean, I just yeah. feel like with Chris, if he had just been laser focused on the music and and with the, all the other stuff that I feel distracts him over the years, if he was I, just I, laser I, focused, he he would be at that level. That's I how think, I feel. I think that I think that we should give him his flowers, though. That's what I believe. I believe that. Fair enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we, I know things about that whole situation that I can't say in the interview, but I'll say this: I believe that when you have a night, he was nineteen, a nineteen-year-old young black man, and he's put in that position. 
I believe that there were adults around who could have been more responsible. He's still a teenager at that point. And, you know, I think that there were, I believe that adults could have been more responsible. They just let him take the hit. And he's never, you know, he's now who he is. But I also believe that if you look at his art, if you look at all the things he's able to do, you can't name too many artists that can do all the things that Chris Brown can do today. I've been fortunate enough to watch him. When we did, I'm going to skip past it. I'm going to go to turn up the music. I watched him direct the video himself. I watched him come up with the core. I, I saw all of that. So to see that he is, um, you know, everybody has their personal thing and everybody has the ability to change after personal mistakes. You know what I mean? And I believe that people should should look at his art and look at how talented he is and not look at one thing. And I think it's um, it's horrible. It's horrible for him because that stays with him and our society allows that to stay with him. But, you know, if he was another color, maybe he wouldn't be stung with that so much if he was really that, if he's that talented. It's tough being a young black artist and doing anything bad and having it not travel with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, like I said, I feel like this is one of the great talents of this generation. Not only the singing, but the dancing as yeah, well. Yeah, I think you know he's what a, I mean? Like, nobody can the be best. in dancing. Here yeah, it is. That's what I'm no saying. No matter, here it is. Here's, the, here's a real fact for you. No matter how, what he does, what R&B singer has caught him? Who can beat him right now? Yeah. Nobody I mean, can beat him. Make yeah, sure you no, put that out there. I said it. They can't beat him. You better go a different. You can't be the next Michael Jackson because he's it right now. You better be the next Lionel Richie. You can't even go that route. You better find another route to go. You're not beating him right now. Yeah, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, I I can't really name. He's anyone. still when he I released. mean, I mean, people people like the weekend, but I feel like. People like his style, but in terms of just straight singing ability, I would put Chris over the weekend. No, Chris, Me Chris, Chris, Chris is the best. I think the weekend is a, um, I think the weekend is a superstar. I think he's a, um, one of the best songwriters ever. I think he, people probably don't pay attention to that enough. I think you love him because his songwriting is so amazing. It's, it's so amazing. You know, he's not going to do, he's not going to dance next to Chris and be, do anything. You know, I think there, there's two different kind of artists, you know? I think uh, he's a different type of artist. I agree. Uh, I agree. Okay. Well, in 2007, the world was introduced to Kim Kardashian on a large scale basis when the tape of her and Ray J what? came out. And for the first time ever, it really propelled the career of somebody to essentially the, the highest level. Um, you know, was that a surprise to you at all in terms of I think, the level I, that she's reached? I think it was because it wasn't your traditional route to become a superstar, but right. Hey, they made it. You can't, you know, Chris is a genius. You know, that's all I can say. You know, I think that whatever, however, if you could take something that might not be to them at the time positive and turn it into a billion dollars, that's, you know, kudos to them is all I can say, you know. Yeah. I mean, even the titles, Kim Kardashian Superstar. So, <laughs> you know, Amen. I mean, they, they pretty much willed it into existence. You know, Again, at the end I'll of the day. say this to you, Mr. Vlad. I wish them the best. Don't turn this into Damon Bash and Kim. Go. We can't have that. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not doing that at all. Shout okay. out to Kim and all her success and everything else like that. Yeah. Uh, and her whole family, for that matter. I mean, they yeah. turned into an empire. Listen, like they turned into you an and actual I were talking empire. About, we talked about this interview for weeks, right? And I told yep. you I don't want to jump in that fight. You notice Kanye ain't said nothing since they took him off Instagram? Yep. Come on, bro. I yep. don't leave, leave exactly. me. I don't want nothing. Whatever power they got, I, <laughs> I, I'm fine over here. I'm happy. This is what happiness looks like, by the way. Yep. You know. Well, in 2008, uh, one of my favorite songs by you came out, uh, Jordan Sparks uh, featuring Chris Brown, No Air. No Air. That was a monster. It was a big monster. And we knew it was a monster before it came out. And I'm going to say this to the whole public, you know, this song started with a guy, Eric Bluetooth Griggs, a good friend of mine. And um, he was introduced to me by Jay Valentine's brother, Robert Noop, Bobby Noop. So Bob was also a part of the whole underdog movement and all that and all our songwriting too. You don't hear much about Bob. So I got to give props to everybody and I'm going to do this more. We're going to do a whole thing on this, on the songs. So, um, so um, Nowhere, let's talk about Nowhere. Started with Bluetooth. 
And this is one of the days that Harvey, I remember we were working on, a, we were working on another movie and I was in this studio C Harvey and um, Bluetooth were in the, in the room across from me. And I remember hearing Harvey sing melodies. This is before any other writers got there. So they had a good idea and I would go back and forth. They had a good idea what this song was going to be. And then there's another writer, um, James Fauntleroy. And James Fauntleroy is one of the biggest songwriters today. We signed James Fauntleroy. And, um, mm. and if I had to have a message to James, I'm going to say this message on that because it's important. You know, there's been, I've heard, you know, because I helped this kid. This is somebody the same way Babyface helped me. I helped him in the beginning. Um, and I believe that, I believe that young people need to show people respect. You know what I mean? Like you see how the respect that I give to Kenny, I believe that respect is due to us. And I think there was, you know, once we, after we signed him, he went and made some deals, you know, and everybody has their right to do their own business. I learned because we had to end up suing Universal over James Fauntleroy. I learned the backdoor deals that were being done. They had nothing to do with me, but we were being blamed for things that we weren't even responsible for, weren't in our control. And um, he ended up being signed with Rock Nation and becoming this great writer. And I applaud him. I think he's great. But at some point, you have to stop being angry at the underdogs and say, hey, this guy, this, those guys gave me my start, no matter how you look at it. Now, let's go back to Nowhere. I'm going to talk about this because I heard him say in the interview, he tried to say certain people on the song wasn't in the song. Well, let me tell you how the song even went. The song wouldn't have never gotten on Chris Brown if it wasn't for me because I'd never wanted the song to be just on Jordan Sparks. She came to our studio after she won American Idol. And I played her the song, but we were initially wanting to keep it on James as an artist. So I said, you can't have this song. But they told us that, they, they told us that Jive, we're not going to re-up your song deal <laughs> with uh, Jive if you don't. We were getting 50 grand a song, so we're not going to re-up your song deal if you don't let Jordan on the song. So I thought quickly, I said, hey, man, I'll let Jordan on the song if y'all put Chris Brown on the song, because we already had 75% of his album over here, right? I said, if you put Chris Brown on it, I knew Take You Down was going to come out. And I, so I'm strategizing as a, as a songwriter, as a publisher, as a businessman. So I made this play. So um, we made the play. And, and this is what I'll say about the song. This is a song that Harvey had a lot to do with. Steve Russell had a lot to do with myself, James, and Bluetooth. The success of this song from creating it to putting it in the right place to doing all of those things. So um, I think it's unfair. I think what James, the narrative was James Fauntleroy wrote, wrote No Air. Well, Steve, I have the demo of it. Steve Russell wrote the B section. You can't, what I know about songwriting and these things is when you create magic, if it's five people in the room that, that gets that song done, you can't make one person can't take credit for that. And so what I've decided to do is through our whole catalog, and you know I have a big catalog, I'm going to go song by song and do some videos and really talk about these things. I could do it with you, Vlad. We can even do that. Talk about how they were created. Talk about who were participated on it, other than just Harvey and Damon, the underdogs, the creatives that were involved. But I think it's fair that everybody get their, gets their respect and just do. And I'll say this to James on the record. Bro, I was there for you, so I've never got a thank you. I've never heard in an interview, Damon. I've never heard anything positive, and I think that I'm owed, owed that by that songwriter because I give that same respect and just to the babyface. No matter what, you could have me and babyface have had an argument before. That don't mean I'm not going to disrespect him. That's my guy. You know what I mean? That's the kind of respect that I want to teach to some of these younger generations because, and that's why Jay Valentine and Tank want me to come and sit down because they want to hear my version of it and I'm going to give that, but this is part of it. Well, uh, the big songs kept coming. Uh, in 2012, you did Justin Bieber, Catching Feelings. Uh, yep. You worked on the Pitch Perfect movie. Yep. Uh, and then there was a the part two and three that you guys worked on as well, right? Yep. Um. And by the way, is the movie money better than music money? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. There you go. Okay. And by the way, the Tory Lane song with Chris Brown, The Take, was that, were you produ the producer of that because they sampled Take yes. You Down? Yeah, or did yeah, you yeah. Actually yeah. Work on they, anytime it? they use your song. Okay, right. Okay, yeah. But you didn't actually work on it. Okay, no. got it. Okay, got it. Okay, I just want to get that right. Uh, okay. And, and you just continued your career. You continued to work. 
with big acts. Put yeah, out oh, yeah. Music so you leaving so out? You leaving out another big movie? Straight out of Compton. Aha! You were talking straight out of Compton. You didn't know that. I did not know that. Yes. Come on, man. Come on, big fella. So let's talk about. I, mi- I missed one. You got to You got to let me miss one or two. Come on. Come on. So the help, oh. the help we did. There's a. There, there, that's a big one. And then straight out of Compton, um, James Brown movie. Get on up. We did all the music for that. So if you want to get into that, we can talk about that stuff. Yeah, I mean, Strata Compton was a was a phenomenon. It was a phenomenon, and we it had was, to... it was a phenomenon. Okay, and I just want to say it's actually ironic. You know, you're working on Strata Compton, and leading up to the movie, Suge Knight essentially tries to do a shakedown with Dr. Dre. Okay, so I'll um, tell you something. So this is good. I can tell you this is for this part of the interview. After working with Tupac. We went to the Bahamas and Shug flew all the masters to death row to the Bahamas. For some reason, they were all on the plane. I remember this. And um, it was a wild trip because we didn't go to do no work. I think he went to go take the masters out there. He booked this studio. No work got done. Right. I'm thinking I'm going to go do some work. And after that point, I was a little done with 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 with. I think he got arrested after that. So that was the end of the death row thing for me. Right. So let's fast forward. I don't think they had the masters at the time. When Universal, or they couldn't get the masters to do the music, so we had to redo a lot of the the um, tracks. I had to redo all of that stuff. Um, where there was um, there was uh, Andrew Hay, Harvey, and I, and one of them, I can't think of our other engineer who worked on all this stuff. I want to give everybody their credit, um, but um, we all worked on this stuff. I went in there every morning recording. Um, um, Ice Cube's son. Ice Cube's son sounds just like him. It was crazy to re-record him on songs that Ice Cube had done. And we had to redo the tracks. It was crazy. So we would, we would get up 8 in the morning, me and WC, um, from Cube's camp, just to make sure the vocals were right. Um, what's the guy who played Easy? I can't think of his name. He had probably, the, it, was, it was the most trouble getting him, but Ice Cube's son absolutely nailed it. Um, the kid that played Dre, he nailed it. Um, but that's Jason, Jason Mitchell, Jason played, Mitchell. Played yeah, easy. but he got, it's tough to yep. get easy. You know, we was trying to, you know, it was tough to get that vocal like that, but it was a great, it was another great experience, another great movie to be a part of. Um, and to do so much in that, in that movie as well, it was pretty cool. And then there's the pitch perfect, pitch perfect one, pitch perfect two. Harvey went on to do pitch perfect three, which that was right around the time we split. So, um, but, um, I'm a part of pitch perfect one and pitch perfect two which is great, big, you know, big, successful movies. So, yeah, um, you know, and then, you know, Strata Compton was a huge success. Um, and I think that was part of the reason why NWA got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, the movie was awesome. It was going the to movie, the, movie I remember going, yeah. going, it was probably one of the coolest premieres. And all these, most of these movies we did for Universal, um, except Dreamgirls was DreamWorks, I believe. No, I'm sorry. It was, it might've been DreamWorks, but it was David Geffen. Geffen financed Dreamgirls itself. Because I remember saying, you know, because it was around American Idol times. Jennifer Hudson hadn't won American Idol. And I didn't know that Jennifer Hudson could sing, sing like that. And um, I was like, we should get there. I was like, they should get Fantasia. And um, I remember a couple guys went in there and told David Geffen to, 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 they should, you know, they mentioned Fantasia and he might have thrown something at him and kicked him out of his house from what I understand. Cool story. <laughs> but Jennifer Hudson came in there when she sang, and I am telling you, like we were, it almost brought tears to your eyes, you know, because that's her kind of movie, you know, that's her kind of thing, that big sounding voice thing. So, you know, um, but back to Straight Outta Compton, it was a great experience. Dre and Cube came to the studio a couple times. And we had a we had a projector at our studio and everything, so they were able to come in. And um, I remember talking to Dre about the Compton album before it came out and the whole thing. It was it was a great experience. Yeah, great movie. I think one of the best. Probably the best hip hop biopic ever, honestly. Yeah, yeah, we I, I would, did that. I would, I would put it above the Biggie movie. I'd put it above the Tupac movie. I, I would, I would put it above everything, really. I mean, it's just a great production, well put together, great storyline. I think, you know, I mean, you're not gonna get it perfect, but I think as someone who knows the story and, and interviewed so many people around the story, I think they nailed pretty much all of it. Yeah. You know, and then you know, with the the drama that happened with Suge going to the set. And ends up accidentally this is killing what I believe. his friend. Suge, Suge, here it is. I think that um, I don't think that Suge meant meant to hurt his friend. 
I, don't I think, think so that, but I also believe that all the shakedowns. I think, and I'll say this to everybody in life. But I've learned is you can't do crazy stuff to people. You know, God ultimately you're gonna pay for it at some point, and that was His time. Like you know, it's unfortunate that it happened that way. I know a different side of Shook, even though, as you said, he tried to shake me down when I was younger. You know, I stood up to him as an adult, and and I know a different side of him. And I, you know, there's a there's a kind side of him that most people don't get to meet. So it's really unfortunate to me. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I remember I interviewed like Reggie Wright Jr., who used to be head of a security. And he said the thing with Suge is that if you could actually, you know, back then during the height of the, the death row era, if you could get to him and ask him sincerely for help, like he he's will help do you. It. Yeah. He's going to he, he's he's paid off mortgages. He's, he's I've, gotten I've people it. out of prison. Look, man, he's helped listen, mothers. Listen, listen. He's helped kids, he child spent, support. He spent hundred. I would say over. I would say over a hundred million dollars over on other people. So you know, I agree. it's yeah. sad that it's sad that it ended that way. I think you know. I think it's unfortunate. You look. You know, and that's part of my journey. That's why I said to you, I wouldn't take back meeting him, being a part of it, getting to know who he really was. You know, getting to know like even who T is. T's still my friend. So knowing who these people are, you don't become that successful and not you're not smart. You know what I mean? It's just what you do with it. It's what you do with it after it, or what you do with the lesson after it. And and that 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 and that comes around to you know what I'm doing here at Thomas Crown. I'm I'm doing positive things. Like it's not about me signing an artist or signing a producer, but having business relationships and business deals with artists so they can own their stuff so they can not you know you hear these stories i want people to own it i want 10 years from now when after i release my artists for us to be friends and be cool with each other life is too short and it's about quality of life and i choose happiness over earning an extra dollar on somebody so for me that's the spirit of of what i'm doing to thomas Crown. yeah and then in 2020 southwest t gets out of prison early and uh, and you guys are still cool to this day, from what I understand. You guys we are. Have talked, talked to and, him yesterday. Yep. And then uh, at the end of 2021, the BMF series comes out, and then now everyone knows uh, about the story. And, and at this point, it's still set at a time before. Oh you yeah, we're gonna get to. Hopefully, hopefully they'll get enough seasons where it gets to all the other stuff. You know, it'll all be the cool. other stuff. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. Uh, in 2022, uh, Kim and Kanye are going through their drama, and you've spoken very respectfully with both of them throughout this interview. So if you were to offer a piece of advice, you know, I mean, as someone who's a father and understands the complexities of, of raising children and sometimes raising children in co-parenting situations and so forth, what, what advice would you give the two of them? I would, um, you know, first of all, look, I admire him for trying to fight for his marriage. If you, if you have that many kids, you should try to fight for your marriage. And I think he still should. I think that he's an amazing um, talent. He's one of the Best. He was my, at one point in the 2000s. He was my favorite rapper by far. There's no question about it. That's before I, they even met each other. You know, I probably Kim and I listened to Kanye when he first college dropout, if I remember. So you know, right. you know, you can't knock that. You know what I mean? His relationship with Kim has nothing to do with how I feel about him as a talented human being. But I think in that, I think that um, you know, him wanting to take his kids to church, I think that's amazing. I think he's amazed what he's done with that. I think also. Um, his music is amazing. What he's able to produce, the things that he's done, what he's accomplished. He's, you know, he's a, you know, he says he's a billionaire. So we have to say Kanye's a billionaire. That's something to be said, you know. So you can't, you know. I don't think it's about the money for him. I think it's about at this point him being a good dad to his kids, and I think that's awesome. So I hope that, um, I hope that they're able just to work it out in that way where they can co-parent, you know and be co-parent warriors with each other, you know what I mean? Because it's important to the kids, you know, you know. Yeah, uh, absolutely, man. I hope it works out. Because at the end of the day, the, the kids are really the ones who are going to take the loss. Yeah. You know what you I know. mean? We, we, you know, both parents are going to have other relationships going to go on with their life, but I think yeah. this is a very important time with a lot of very young kids also, you know? Yeah, I think, and, so uh, I, 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 hope just, they, I hope they work it out in whatever way that is. Yeah, yeah, that's that's me too. I'm, I'm, I'm always a champion in that, you know. Uh, well, Damon Thomas, man, like I, I gave you a call before our interview and I said, and this is a rarity for me because usually I I'm on top of it, but I'm like, you have so many records <laughs> that I'm having problems figuring out what to even talk about 
Like, what are the, the huge records versus the very big records and so forth? Because there's so many. The catalog is so extensive. And I feel like you not really being a public person that's all the way out there like a lot of other people, you know, people don't realize the breadth of the catalog and, and the movie stuff that you were doing. Like, I didn't know about Straight Outta Compton. Yeah. And, and you see what I'm saying? Like, well, I, got, I, got, I just got lost with all the other movies that you yes, did. Yes, a lot of movies, <laughs> you, know? you know, and, you know, um, you know, we, I mean, like, it's funny to see Harvey Weinstein go with, went through what he went through. He was at the studio with us when we did Bobby. That's his movie. So to have all these heavyweight people in the studio with us was amazing. It was just an amazing journey, you know. Well, well the, the help, the help was Weinstein's movie also, right? Yeah, we did both of those movies. So, yeah. you know, after that, you know, when we did the help, that was, you know, we were nominated for a Golden Globe. And to be able to go to the Golden Globes was such a cool thing, or the Oscars, any of that. It's so cool because you walk up, Brad Pitt's right there, this person's right there. It's they're there. You know, you know, you're in the you're in a different it's different than it's much different than the music stuff. And I love it all. I love the Grammys, I love the Golden Globes, the Critics' Choice Awards, the Oscars, all that stuff. It's amazing to be a part of any of it in your journey of music. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, and I've been a part of all of that. So, you know, outside of me marrying um, a very famous person who wasn't that person at the time when we got married, we were just two young people in love. I've, I've done my thing as well as she. I just don't, I don't, I'm just not going to now start talking about it. So um, we could talk about these songs if you want to talk about some of them right now, but I think we should do a series where we talk about the song. And if you're up I for agree. that, I'm down I agree. with that. And I can well, break David it down. Thomas, man. Oh, yeah. Well, David Thomas, man, I appreciate you coming in and sharing your story. I think a lot of people are, are going to be shocked, you know, when they hear about the whole catalog and they yeah. hear about the whole story and so forth. Because like I said, you're a very low-key guy, uh, you know, but I feel like it's important for people like yourself to get your flowers. Because a lot yeah. of times producers as a whole are really under the radar for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. They're, they're not the guys on stage. They're not the, the girls in the video. And they're not doing the the Good Morning America interviews and so forth. But you guys and girls are just as important, sometimes even more than the actual artists. You know, because not only are you producing, but oftentimes you're also writing the songs. You know, it's, yeah, and, yeah, I write. So I'm, anything I produce, I'm a writer on. It's not like exactly. I'm a, it's the, the, they go hand in hand with me. And I'll say this to you. You know, most people say that when you switch over to the business side, you know the this the you know after the split with Harvey and I in 2015 or 16 whenever it was almost 2016, um, I took the time to educate myself business wise to understand things that I didn't understand and to build a roster of talent from the ground up and um, and to teach and to teach them about ownership and educate them before we release things this year. Um, I think we have a, a responsibility to artists because things are different now. Anytime that you have hip hop artists coming out independent and making more money than pop artists because of their deals, you know, the, I had to figure that out. How is this? You know, I ain't nothing wrong with being a rapper. That's the, you know, but how are they making 10 times more money than this guy? And you supposed to be the elite, but because they own it, they were smart mm -hmm. enough to own it. So the reality is a lot of hip hop artists were smarter than R&B producers or pop producers because they figured out how to own their business. So I said, hey, man, I got to go do some catch up and figure it out so that I can own my business and then educate people on the mistakes or the things that I've learned along the way. Because now, look, if we made, if Harvey and I, I'll just throw a number, if we made uh, 50 million, they made 600 million, you know, so I don't want to, I don't want to be the guy that makes a million and leaves 10 million on the table anymore. I want to make my money. So that's oh, kind of yeah. where I'm at, you know, and it's not so for me as a writer and producer, I do the music because I love it. I've, my whole headspace is I can give the music a way to go sell some product. I want to sell t-shirts and makeup and other stuff. So, and I got that. So if you want to go back to Kanye, you learn that from him. You learn he's, he doesn't care about his record sales. He sells product. Period. Oh, oh yeah. No, Don <laughs> Two came out on a, on a $200 stem player. And yeah. then I think, that's it. I think it never even hit streaming services. Yeah, he kudos you know to him for selling yeah. like like you know anytime you got Gap, Balenciaga, and whatever you know, and Adidas, like he's 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 gonna be set. So you know. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, David Thomas, man, I appreciate you doing your what I feel is your first real 
sit-down interview with Vlad TV. It's definitely an honor with someone of your stature. Uh, I learned a lot from just, you know, not only talking to you, but really going through the research. Uh, I didn't realize how much of a fan I was. I didn't know how many songs I was listening to or movies I was watching that you actually had your hands in, man. So I was very humbled by going through the process. And I totally appreciate you coming in and talking and uh, looking forward to doing more things with you. I'm looking forward to do it. <laughs> Let's get it. That's what it is. Peace. All right, man.